and that was blessed. Thank you guys. Um, now that list that we give you is a bit muddled, so would you like to tell me what the next one is, please? Sorry about that. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Okie doke. Can I just have a quick look at that? Just one second. which means rhyme of another summer, la premidi, which means afternoon.
Okay, the next song is called Le Moulin, which means the mill. <laughs> It's a bit muddled, so would you like to tell me what the next one is, please? Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Okie doke. Can I just have a quick look at that? So it feels really important to say at the outset that I am aware that there are certain situations where it's really important to know someone's biological sex. I mean, obvious examples would be certain medical procedures. But also, for example, if someone has been in any way treated by someone of the opposite sex, to be in certain situations with someone of ambiguous sex can be at the very least disconcerting and upsetting. So I'm aware of that. And the purposes of this talk I'm thinking about um, kind of open public spaces at work, shops, walking down the high street and what have you. But first, a short point. While nature loves variety, society favours conformity compared to the majority, predictable and easily defined, I find I'm a perplexity, epitome of gender fluidity, non-binary, neither and both, him and her. I am a gender. <laughs> so, I. Sorry, I said one of those two. So, uh, what does being a gender mean? Um, can I even know if anyone got any thoughts about what being a gender means to them? Any thoughts? I, I thought so when you don't really um, have a, a strong gender. 
gender identity, like you, you don't mind whether you're male or female. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thank, thank you, Grace. Yeah, I mean, it, thank you for that. I mean, for me, being a gender is as simple in our gender stereotype Western world as problematical as this. As the brief verse that I just read suggests, uh, I don't identify exclusively with either gender polarity. Since childhood, I've oscillated between the two, though for me the male polarity pulls especially strongly. I was comfortable with cropped hair, makeup free, in jeans, shirt, and trainers. When asked, well, why do you want to look like a man? My response is, well, I don't want to look like a man, and I don't want to look like a woman. So, is being a gender the result of nature or nurture? Again, has anyone any thoughts about that? Um, I mean, personally feel that we're born with predispositions. I mean, uh, neuroscientists, some of the latest sort of work that neuroscientists are doing suggests that we can actually even identify structures within the brain that differ between genders, biology and the sex. I mean, you know, so there's lots of work going on to suggest that actually it, they have predis predispositions that are in our nature. But it's, the, it's nurture that either encourages or inhibits their expression. That's, that would be my view on that one. So when I reflect on my upbringing, I can clearly see the influence of nurture on my developing sense of self. However, were it not in my nature, I strongly believe I wouldn't identify as agender. That is, being agender doesn't feel like a choice. For example, from my youngest years, I was taught that men are superior to women. However, I don't want a penis. I'd like the privileges and advantages that having a penis seems to grant those who've got one, but I'm more than happy with my female genitals. But then again, when my breasts were removed for medical reasons, I felt relieved and didn't hesitate to turn down the option of breast reconstruction. Over the years, I've observed with curiosity, more often consternation, the roles men and women adopt and play. Even as a child, I saw how those roles and the ideas behind them largely seem to advantage men and keep women in subordinate positions that are neither natural nor inevitable. For instance, the idea that a woman's value is commensurate with her ability to gratify principally male expectations, and especially around her physical desirability, I believe contribute significantly to at least some of the inequalities that we live with today. So it's complicated. As complex as a subject I'd like to move on to, namely, why some gender conforming people feel disquiet towards those of us who don't conform. And again, could I just ask has anyone got a view on why that might be? unhelpful behaviour, but I do feel it's uh, explainable. Everything that constitutes our experience and expectations 
is largely acquired by chance without critical reflection. The vast majority of people, it is the case, match long established descriptions of masculinity and femininity that we acquire from our youngest years. The sound of my voice contradicts the shape of my body. My appearance in general doesn't suggest my biological sex. In fact, if anything, I'm quite often mistaken for a man until I open my mouth and start to speak. So am I really surprised then when some people find me perplexing? I don't think I should be. I think it's quite natural. Because when anything that is usually easy to identify confounds us, understandably, we can feel at the very least uncomfortable. So how to be more accepting and respectful of diversity and respond constructively when it challenges us? While shock or disquiet can be a natural reaction to someone who doesn't match our expectations, it's what happens next that I think is crucial. And I know this is much easier said than done, but I think it would be really helpful if we could ask ourselves some questions. Does this person actually pose a threat to my personal safety, health and well-being? Is this person willfully entering my personal space and welcomed and uninvited? Is this person preventing me from living in my own terms according to my beliefs and personal philosophy of life? For years, complete strangers have intruded into my world uninvited and unwelcomed and directed disparaging remarks towards my androgyny. How would they answer those questions? I can assure them I am not a threat to their personal safety, health or well-being. I'd never knowingly enter anyone's world unwelcomed and uninvited. Neither do I want to prevent any law-abiding citizen, of whom I am one, from living in their own terms according to their personal beliefs and philosophy of life. Well, thank you for listening to that and thank you for your contributions. And I'm going to end with a quote from Canadian-born psychiatrist Eric Brown, who is perhaps best known as the creator of transaction analysis and the games people play, uh, to which I gave a passing nod earlier when I referred to observing uh, the roles men and women adopt and play. So, Burns refers to a little boy in this quote, but he could, of course, have been just as easily referring to someone, someone who was a little girl or someone of no definite gender. The moment a little boy is concerned with which is a jay and which is a sparrow, he can no longer see the birds or hear them sing. <laughs>
It's just not very loud. Oh, well, I'm not really bad. No. No, you don't have to. Yeah. Like. Okay. Um, this next one's called Masungana, and it means bringing people together, which is very apt for um, this festival. Thank you. 
this one on? No. Okay. Um, the next one, this last one's called Naima Musasa, um, and it's uh, about bringing in the wood. The soldiers, when they were making camp on their travels, they're bringing in the wood. But there is a song. Can I have? As said, um, I'm just going to tell you some of my thoughts and poems and hopefully make you laugh a little bit. Um, I'm going to start and intersperse this 20 minutes or so with a few tips that I got a while ago when I asked people on Facebook for tips on public speaking. Pretend everyone's naked apart from you. Practice the speech loads of times to make sure that everything you want to say rolls easily off the tongue. My DJ tip was always wear a hat with a brim so you can hide the audience behind it. Pick a point at the back of the room above everyone's head and focus on that. That way you don't have to deal with eye contact. Try not to speak too fast. Take your time and enjoy yourself. Don't talk crap. Wear nice shoes. I say, thank you. That's the start. So I'll give you some more tips later on. Um, I'm going to start with one called Blue Byways, which is true. It happened to me. And uh, it made me think, like, especially, I think it's especially for today, um, you can say, oh yeah, they're autistic, they're like this, or whatever. But um, everyone is different. And not just different from the norm, like boring person norm, but we're also different from each other, which I think is ace. So this is Blue Byways. Jack only likes blue bios. He signs in at reception easily, confidently, straight away if there's a blue pen there. But black bios are difficult for Jack. He has to have a couple of goes then, like a rub up to write in his name. Leslie sometimes swaps them on purpose when he comes in. She reckons he'll get used to them. Leslie is an idiot. Jack is autistic, keen, friendly, good at his job. I sympathise. I really hate blue biros. Can't stand having the tops on them. And then Helen brings in a box of purple biros. I love them. For a receptionist in an art centre, this is the best I'm going to get. Beautiful doodles. My notes look creative. Phone messages are less plain. Jack is absolutely horrified. Purple biros. I give him a blue one to keep. You have this one, Jack. Thanks. Okay, a couple more tips. Um, people often have a problem with being on stage or speaking in front of a group, but when you think about it, it's a really common everyday thing to do. That's from my brother, that one. Always wise. So now this one is a bit of a silly um, ten-year-old me perspective rage against my parents who were awful and made me wear clothes that I didn't like. <laughs> So this one is called Peter Storm, and Peter Storm, for people younger than me, is the name of um, a like cagoule making company. They made um, like walking clothes, but they weren't called at all. It was awful. Peter Storm, Peter Storm, you are to blame. If that really is your name. If only you fashioned something good like a cape, then I could make my great escape through the rain while lightning forks bounce off my wax hats, bouncing corks. Instead, I'm slouching, put up, head down, with rain dripping off my nose, and my frown saying to all passers-by, no need for a voice, this yellow thing was not my choice. My mum said, it's like an anorak, but you can fold it up like a pack of mac Thanks mum, that's ace, thanks very much. So you're not completely out of touch. You know exactly what isn't cool to get optimum teasing for me at school. It's not even cool though, in the literal sense. There's water inside, rain and sweat contents. So it's sticky and warm, it's like wearing a sauna. I tell you what, I wish I'd worn a different coat than this. I'd be dry and warm. I curse you warm, and I curse you, Peter Storm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to tell you another one now, which is surprising. Um, it's called City Boy, and I wrote it uh, on an art course, uh, on, art course on a writing course. <laughs> um, it was based on going somewhere and someone else not liking it, so that's why it's so vicious, but it is also true. City Boy. We got the bus out to the countryside, 